Hello, World Civ scholars. We're, we're, we're uh, coming to the end of our discussion of these, these civilizations, and we've been exploring in Islamic civilization and today East Asian civilization, and then we'll come back to how Western civilization, which is by the end of our course here now, the smallest of the civilizations, the weakest of the civilizations, this Christian civilization, which inhabits uh, north of Spain and, and pretty much uh, uh, what is now called Western Europe, in relationship to a massive Islamic civilization, massive East Asian civilization spreading out to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, and, and uh, a Confucian Buddhist alliance which is invigorated by trade and such from the from the uh, uh, Mongol invasions and the and the and an Islamic Dar al Islam which the Mongol invasions have also vivified and pushed out into India and and down into Malaysia and stuff like that so so um, really dynamic world here where it's at the end of it looks like uh, the West will be the least important and so let's, I, I have you reading about this. Uh, these are chapters in the, in the book. And, uh, um, you know, what you're looking at is uh, with Su Dong Po is this, is this period of the Song uh, dynasty in which there's all this flourishing. The Mongols come in between and then even a continuing flourishing. The Confucian scholar, bureaucrat, the arts, the literature doesn't die with Su Dong Po and when the Mongols come in, it flourishes after. And so this, uh, this shows the, the ongoing flourishing of Chinese uh, intellect and Chinese uh, just amazing culture, okay, and political center. And so we're out here at the very end of the course and see the Mongols come in here and then and then we have the Ming followed because the, the Mongols uh, can't sustain, they, they, they infuse themselves, like we talked about last time, they're, they're, they, they in, in, embrace the language, they embrace the educational system, they embrace the, the, the values, and ultimately they invigorate the, the Grand Canals and the Great Wall and all sorts of things, and, and then a new dynasty arrives, which is a Chinese dynasty called the Ming. Now, uh, what we're interested in with the Ming is just I want to give an example, uh, you know, of, of its dynamism, you know. Uh, and what we do is we look to this guy, the third emperor, uh, and uh, you know what he wants to do is this reign of perpetual happiness, very important, and you know he wants to expand upon past successes. Now the capital's been moved up to Beijing by the Mongols. What is what? When I grew up, it was called Peking, but now it's called Beijing, which is the name that they, they would uh, the Chinese would like us to use. And so the forbidden city in Beijing becomes the capital and remains the capital well, until today. The Grand Canal and the infrastructures are, are more fully laid out because trade becomes such a dynamic uh, way of uh, invigoration. Of it. And then Confucian education and exams continues, okay? And they want to... This is the important part. They want to engage with the world, at least here in the beginning. Here's a picture of the Forbidden City, you know, in the capital. But this is what I want to introduce. This is a thing that the Chinese themselves today are promoting. It, uh, there was a book, which we'll talk about, uh, written in, uh, it's called 1420. Oh, well, I don't know. I'll have to go, go look at it again. But it's about the Chinese before Columbus. And they're great sailing ships, all right? And uh, we have this, this uh, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 15th century, you know, 80, 90 years before Columbus. Uh, this is Columbus's largest ship, which is pretty normally, you know, good normal size for uh, uh, what Europe can produce. This is what the Chinese were producing, the Ming were producing, uh, you know, 180 years before that. Okay, now you can see how wide these are. This is a model in, in uh, I think it's Nanking, where they, uh, they uh, promote this as, uh, uh, and, and it's, there's huge amounts of truth to it, and, uh, and yet there's a type of mystery to it too, and we'll get to that in a second. But these treasure ships, 
are built on a Confucian model. And I want to, you know, keep an eye, keep, always keep an eye on the Confucianism. Uh, and it's this, it's the four cardinal directions, the four seasons, the four cardinal Confucian virtues, propriety, integrity, righteousness, modesty. And so the boat is 444 chi long, which this is bigger than the uh, Star of India downtown in San Diego. Bigger than that. And look at this. Look at this. And look how wide it is. You can pick this boat. You can pick two or three boats of this and put them sideways. It has these uh, full batten sails, you know, the, what's called the junk rig. And, uh, and really, uh, an amazing sailing vessel. Uh, now, what did you do with these? Is they had this admiral. He's a Muslim eunuch admiral. The, they're, you know, a Muslim admiral who's, who's in, uh, brought into the, um, into the, into the, the, the power structure of society. Uh, they're, they're, uh, this is that wider vision uh, that they're not narrow. And so uh, this uh, admiral Zheng He then uh, takes these treasure ships on what is essentially a diplomatic sort of mission. It's comparable to what uh, Teddy Roosevelt did when, when the United States built up its Navy, the White Fleet. We sent that White Fleet around the world to show off, but also to say, hey, we're the biggest thing on the block. We are, we, we are tough, we are powerful, we, have, we can rule the seas, we are amazing. Okay? So these are treasure ships, they're not warships that are sent out, but they go... And they go around, and you can imagine how impressive they are. You know, they, they come up off the coast of, of Africa, and uh, you see this thing, and, and they, you know, no, nobody's ever seen anything like that ever in the world. And you go, wow, look at that thing flo floating off of there. And then they would engage in uh, diplomacy. Uh, usually, you know, it takes some ambassadors back and forth, but also do what we do today, which is that, uh, you know, we've talked about that uh, Charlemagne did with uh, Harun al-Rashid with an elephant. You know, there's animals, there's different stuff. This whole idea of, of, of we're going to uh, not rule the world all as one, but we, want, we are the middle kingdom. We are the, we are the great benefactor to the world, and the world should look to us as its benefactor, and we will... We will condescend to look to the world as our, uh, as our, as our, as well, as our, as something that we will help, as our children type of thing. And so, Zheng Ha, and this is sort of fun. He, uh, Zheng Ha, now he has to take a smaller boat. You can't get those big boats into, you know, to tack them up here into uh, Mecca. But he does his, his, uh, his Hajj, you know, his pilgrimage to Mecca during his trip, and uh, and makes all the way around. And this is, today, very important for China's promoting itself as um, uh, a world power in the 15th century that uh, it may be wanting to reestablish, or at least uh, let the world know uh, it wants to be in the 21st century. Now, the book I was telling you about that came out and when I read it, I was fascinated by this. This is, uh, the book is written by a submarine captain, a British submarine captain in retirement. Yeah, I love these guys. And he knows the ocean well. And, and it's true. Everything he says in there is absolutely true, is that these boats, that instead of just staying here, actually, you know, they, they follow the currents. You know, they, you put the sails out and you get blown by the currents and the winds. And you get over to South America up here and you get blown back over to, uh, to over here to Australia and then take that Japan current. And these boats are certainly capable of making that Japan current trip back to the coast of what is now the United States. So this book would have Point Loma with me. I'm looking out at the ocean right there off of our classroom. And, and right out there beyond the kelp bed would have sat one of these 400 foot monster treasure ships maybe, you know. What a vision, what a, what a vision of the past, you know? Now, this is all right now, all speculation, but you, you, during your lifetime, uh, the Chinese archaeologists and other archaeologists around the world are working on this model to find evidence 
that these Chinese ships had crossed the Atlantic and come to the Americas 80 years before Columbus, okay? And I, 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 I think there's a good, good chance it's true. But even if it's not true that they get around the world, it's, it is this thing, thing that we just want to go, wow, uh, at the power and vitality of this early Ming dynasty, which had been invigorated by the Mongols and Confucianism and Buddhism return into great power. It's uh, and then we're gonna at this point in the fifth in the 16th century we start sending missionaries, Matteo Ricci, and this is all part of World Civ too. But our Jesuit missionaries that come into Macau and into China and stuff like that are just amazed, you know. And uh, but they're uh, and they will become amazed at us too. But uh, certain things. But uh, we will. There will always be this. Um, Mother load of China, and we're going to talk more about this. China's got everything, and this is what going back to the Marco Polo trip, you know, it's China's China's the mother load on Earth, and so we everybody wants to get to China. This motivates everybody, and why? Because you know China is really the middle kingdom. It is sort of something that's got going on. They're so dynamic, and I I would tend to believe that this in your lifetime they'll discover this is true. This, You'll find evidence around here somewhere of, of these Chinese ships. Now, to finish off just on the Ming, what happens, though, is in the late 15th century, you see, they start to actually turn inward. They, they burn the records of, this is one of the reasons there's a lot of mystery to these boats. They burn records of these boats. Shipbuilding laws were implemented to restrict the size. They don't want to build those big boats. They actually put those big boats in and let them just fall apart. Okay, and then uh, the decline of the Ming Navy allowed to grow uh, uh, the growth of the Japanese uh, piracy on the coast. You know, and so instead of fighting the pirate uh, pirates with a, a vigorous navy, they choose to instead to withdraw into interior villages. They actually pull their population inward. And so this isolation that starts in the, with the Ming in the late uh, 15th century will be there for the next three, 400 years and uh, will be their dominant characteristic so that the Europe will later on feel the obligation with the, with the Americas to open China. And uh, this horrible part of the war, we, we we're basically drug cartels. We do this opium war. We we have a we do a, a whole bunch of stuff to uh, to really weaken the dynamics of China, weaken them in such a way that leads into the 20th century. They're conquered by Japan, and then communist China rises up in the mid 20th century, and so a whole new world is sort of created. But that's World Civ too. But at the end of our class, we can see in the year 1500, you know, this great China is turning inward. And it will become this, it won't be a major factor in the world during the first 300 years, 400 years of World Civ II, the next class after this one. So, fascinating stuff. Um, let me turn this off. Hope, uh, send me messages. Uh, if you got any ideas, you want to talk, uh, feel free. Feel free.